Hello, everybody. Welcome to another class of Admo 412. Before we start, how is everybody doing? Are you doing well? Are you staying inside? Please tell me you're staying inside. Um, I've been staying inside and so far, luckily, I've been okay. Um, I have received some sad news this morning as I've heard that um, one of my teachers from middle school unfortunately passed away. Um, it's been really sad. Um, and I've been thinking about her, um, since I heard the news, um, she, she really had a big influence on my life. Uh, she was a very kind woman. Um, she knew how to be rough at times. You definitely didn't want to mess with her, but she was really, really kind and really sweet. Um, she was probably the only teacher I've ever had that was only encouraging all the other teachers, uh, they really took their time to explain to me how I would fail at anything I attempted to do in my life. But she was very encouraging and almost sort of um, indulgent with all my whims. Um, partly because of her, I had developed a deep passion for music in middle school. And I thought I wanted to become an orchestra conductor and a composer when I grew up. Um, I started writing music and I start, I wrote music all the time, uh, because of, of that passion. Not that I had any education or any particular training at doing that, um, or any talent for that matter, but I just liked to, to write music. Um, she was always very sweet, always looked at whatever I wrote and she never said, you know, but, but this is horrible. Um, she would always find a good way to spin it. Um, that would make me feel um, better. I remember this one time um, during math class, I wasn't paying attention because I didn't care. And I started writing some music. Uh, I decided I wanted to write some music. And I realized that nobody had ever written a concerto for piano and tambourine. And so I thought, I'm going to fix that. And that's what I started doing. And so for the entire class, for the entire math class, I wrote this concerto with no, you know, musical aid to check whether what I was writing was good or bad. I just wrote. And um, next class was music. And so I went to the teacher and I gave her the music sheet. I was like, hey, look at what I did, you know, wrote concerto for um, music and tambourine, you know, C major. And um, she just took the music sheet and sat down at the piano and started playing it. Um, of course, it was probably one of the worst pieces of music ever written by a human being or animal for that matter. Um, it was absolutely atrocious, but it didn't matter. You know, she just played. And at the end, we, uh, the entire class and her, we just laughed along. And it was, it was a lot of fun, actually. Um, it was very encouraging to have a teacher that didn't say, oh, you're just bad at that, stop doing it, but was actually, um, you know, always positive with whatever I was doing. And every time I went back home to Italy, I always thought I would pay her a visit and um, tell her that even though I didn't end up being a musician, and I think we can all be happy <laughs> that I didn't, <laughs> But even though I didn't become a mus musician in the end, I still have a big appreciation and a big passion for music. Um, and it's all because of her. And uh, it really made me sad to realize that, unfortunately, I will not have the opportunity to tell her this anymore. Um, do you guys have teachers like that? Do you have teachers that really had a big influence on your life? Um, and don't say, oh, well, it's you, Beppe, because I don't like flattery, okay? Well, okay, I suppose I do like flattery a little bit, but I'm not going to give you any extra point if you say that, okay? In all seriousness, though, if you have teachers like that, uh, please stop whatever you're doing, pause this video, call them up, and tell them how much they meant to you. Um, I've been a teacher a year and a half now, and I am really starting to appreciate how much the thought of possibly influencing, in a positive way, obviously, 
the lives of your students really matters. Uh, how rewarding the idea that we could have a positive impact on your lives. And if you have a teacher that really changed things for you, that really made the difference, please don't hesitate to let them know. Call them right now. Write them an email because, well, you never know when you know, when you will lose the opportunity to do so forever. Okay, so that was my quarantine thought of the day. Um, and uh, I think having said that, we can start with the class. So today's topic is, is actually a beautiful subject that I didn't think I would like uh, so much, uh, but I do, and I hope you also like that. Uh, the subject is cold air damming. Um, actually, fun fact, when I first heard of cold air damming, I thought it was damming as in, you know, D-A-M-N-I-N-G, like damnation. And I was envisioning, I don't know, biblical things that would happen to this cold air. Um, but it turns out it's just damning, D-A-M-M-I-N-G. So nothing to do with damnation of the cold air, which if you ask me, it would have been a lot cooler and a lot better. Um, uh, but, well, I guess, you know, that's that. So, um, cold air damming is kind of, uh, place specific in a way. Um, unlike all the other topics that we talked about, um, cold air damming is not something that could happen everywhere in the mid-latitudes, you know, at 45 degrees latitude or what have you. Uh, but it actually needs a, uh, you know, a mountain chain uh, oriented in a certain way. And conditions have to kind of line up um, in order for cold air damming to, to happen. So it's not something that is quite as generic as, um, as extratropical cyclones, for example. But nevertheless, it's something that is important to consider, I think, because it could affect um, many places on the mainland, uh, you know, be them the Appalachian Mountains, where we will see many examples, um, or the West Coast. Um, it can also affect other countries, so it doesn't have to be uh, just, uh, you know, East Coast and West Coast. So, you know, just keep in mind that this is something that, even though it's place-specific, it's not like, you know, it's a place that is so remote that why are we even looking at that? You know, it's not like we're looking at some weird feature of Antarctica and, you know, like, why the hell we're even bothering to do that? Um, okay, so... Um, Colder damming is, as we said, terrain influenced. Um, the main ingredients of uh, cold air damming are a mountain chain, um, typically oriented north south, uh, or you know, it's better that it, if it's oriented north north south, it's a little bit easier to for this to be realized. Uh, it needs uh, a stably stratified atmosphere, so something that would encourage the blocking of um, of this cold air, this trapping of this cold air. Um, physically, we can think of cold air damming essentially as a geostrophic adjustment process. Um, so far, we have afforded to neglect all things that happen on the surface. So we've forgotten about friction and mountains and all that. But it turns out that uh, when you include those effects, those can actually uh, interfere with uh, the large scale circulation. Certainly if you imagine having something really big, some really big mountains, for example, you know, Mount Everest or, you know, the Tibetan Plateau, that can have a huge influence on whatever is happening in the atmosphere, even aloft. It can interact with the jet stream and whatnot. And it so happens that in certain parts of the country, uh, for example, in the southeast, uh, sort of North Carolina region, uh, the Appalachian Mountains are strong enough, big enough, that they can actually influence the weather in significant ways. Um, not only there, cold air damming can happen, though. As we said, we'll see examples. We'll just mention examples in, in, other, uh, in other regions. The basic ingredient of cold air damming, however, is cold air. You guessed right. Um, and cold air, 
shallow, a shallow layer of cold air that has to be trapped in front of a mount. Uh, what we are seeing here is uh, actually the chart that we're seeing on the slide. Uh, it's quite beautiful, actually. And this is a surface temperature and precipitation analysis for a day, 20 January in 1920. So this is what weather maps look like in, um, in 1920. Not saying they were necessarily better or worse, but, you know. That's what they were. Uh, okay, so let's start to look at, let's start looking at colder damming from a physical perspective. And it's quite intuitive, quite simple. Uh, and so let's get right to it. Um, normally, if you have geostrophic flow, by definition, pressure gradient force and Coriolis are balanced, right? This is how geostrophic um, flow arises, is a balance between these two forces. Now, imagine this situation where you have a topographic uh, barrier, let's say north-south oriented, for simplicity, and, um, and let's imagine that uh, we have uh, a pressure gradient force where now you have lower pressure to the south and higher pressure to the north. Uh, look very carefully at the slides. We're talking sea level pressure. So this is not 500 millibar geopotential heights or, you know, upper tropospheric pressure or whatever. This is lower tropospheric pressure. So you're going north, you're encountering higher and higher pressure. Okay, so the isobars are increasing as you go north. And so the pressure gradient forth, force is directed southward, right? So uh, the balance between these two will create an easterly flow. So air is now coming from the east and well, the air is gonna hit the mountain, okay? Now, what can happen when the air hits the mountain? Uh, well, there are a couple of scenarios, if you will. First scenario when, um, when the air encounters the mountains is, well, the air just goes over the mountain and so you'll observe a little bit of um, a warming, a little bit of cooling as the air ascends, uh, ascends and then warming uh, on the other uh, on the other side. And so this will generate uh, essentially, um, this will generate uh, high pressure upwind and low pressure downwind. Pretty simple. And so as you could imagine, this simple flow will affect the pressure in some form. Okay, but otherwise the flow can continue. However, let's imagine that um, let's imagine that the flow is not successful at passing over the mountain. And this could happen for two reasons, if you will. Well, it could happen for many reasons, but mainly for two reasons. The first reason is that well, the flow isn't really strong enough, so the velocity of the flow is not high enough that even a small mountain is enough to stop it. Or, another way to think about this, the mountain may be too high, you know, for the type of flow that you're observing. And so, you know, the air goes up, but then it kind of stay, stays trapped on that side. There is a way to make this comparison between this assessment, if you will, more than comparison, this assessment quantitative. And this is through a number called Froude number, F-R-O-U-D-E. And this is defined as the ratio of the velocity of the flow over the height of the mountain barrier and the brune weissala um, frequency, okay? The square of this number n is uh, related to the stability of the atmosphere, if you will, okay? So when the flow is not strong, so u is very small, fruit number is very, uh, very low, but also when H is very big, fruit number is smaller than one, or when N is very big, so very strong stat static stability, fruit number is a lot slower, smaller than one. So when that happens, uh, well, what are we going to have? Well, when that happens, the flow uh, kind of slows down because of the mountains, right? It's going to be like some high pressure, the flow slows down, and that in turn... Uh, disrupts the balance between the Coriolis force and the pressure gradient. Now, the pressure gradient force is given by, I don't know, the, 
the atmospheric conditions. You know, maybe you have a high pressure center to the north, and that's creating these isobars distributed that way. So those isobars are going to stay the way they are. But the Coriolis force is related to the motion of the air parcel. And so if the air parcel slows down, Coriolis force also diminishes. And so this disruption of balance means that now the parcels will uh, feel a pressure gradient force uh, directed directed southward. And because of the geometry of the problem, the flow is going to turn to the left or it's going to turn northerly, so towards the south. Okay. Um, and so, uh, and so uh, you'll have this disruption that uh, will create a northerly direction of the wind and it will also uh, move the direction of the Coriolis force because the Coriolis force is always going to be perpendicular to um, to the velocity vector. At the very you know at the end of the day, uh, the turn will be complete. The flow will be uh, perfectly uh, northerly, let's say, and it will just flow uh, following the pressure gradient force towards the south, but the Coriolis force, it's not going to shut down, obviously. Coriolis force is always going to be there, but it's not going to be directed to contrast the pressure gradient force. It's going to be directed perpendicular to the flow, which means in this particular case, as you can see on the slide, it's going to be directed westward towards the mountain. So you have this barrier, and now the Coriolis force is pushing the air uh, towards the mountain, and the air is just going to flow southward, you know, sort of feeling squeezed, uh, squeezed um, against uh, against the mountain. Um, what's going to happen on the other side of the mountain? Well, on the other side of the mountain, it's exactly the same situation. The flow was disrupted, and so um, the uh, geostrophic balance doesn't apply anymore. Now, however, <clears throat> you have pressure gradient is going to generate a southerly flow, but the Coriolis is going to push air or pull air away from the mountain. So in one case, you're pushing towards the mountain. You're accumulating a lot of air. So as you can imagine, you're going to develop high pressure because you're going to squeeze a lot of air. On this side of the mountain, however, you're taking... Um, you are taking um, air away, and so the pressure effectively diminishes, okay? And so you end up creating essentially ridging upwind and troughing uh, downwind. Now, notice that if you look at these lines and you compare the, these lines and sort of the uh, the waves that these lines make, you compare them with your intuition of 500 millibar geopotential heights, you'd be tempted to say that, well, actually, no, it's ridging downwind and troughing upwind, but be careful because ridging and troughing doesn't have to do with the particular shape, it has to do with whether the pressure is increasing or decreasing. 500 millibar heights, the ones that you were thinking about, pressure decreases going northward. And so whenever you have uh, a wave does, that goes down, that corresponds to a trough because you have lower values that are coming down. In this case, however, because of how the, uh, because of the setup of the system, um, the troughs, meaning the incoming, the, the, the moving in of the lower pressure, if you will, um, is going to look like a ridge for the 500 millibar chart. So always be very mindful when you think about troughing and ridging um, that the intuition that you build on a 500 millibar geopotential height is dependent upon typical case scenario or certain assumptions that may not be verified um, in all cases. Um, this is a uh, this is an example. Of, um, of a cold air damming event. Um, now, we've seen this before. This We'll come back to this later and we'll show uh, other examples. 
Um, we've seen this when we talked about, if you remember when we talked about extratropical cyclones, we said um, that, uh, you know, at some point you had the sort of the low pressure that were was going through an area of a high pressure and kind of resurfacing, you know, tunneling out and resurfacing afterwards. This is exactly that case. And it was a cold air damming event that had created this weird pattern where uh, you had like ridging downwind, sorry, upwind. Um, so notice low pressure system to the, to the south, high pressure system to the north, northeast, um, and the mountain range, the, you know, Appalachian, uh, mountain range um, and this is exactly what you then end up finding typically um, there is there are asymmetries that are generated um, there are generated in these cases because um, usually during most Appalachian colder damming events the amplitude of the ridge is act to the east is actually greater than that of the trough uh, to the west. And this is essentially to do with the fact that you're advecting cold air um, from um, upwind, you're advecting cold air from the north, and this effectively enhances the ridge and, uh, and weakens the trough. It's not a big uh, asymmetry, but sometimes it happens, and so it's good to know uh, what this is, um, this is caused by. Now, we said, um, I'm going to continue drinking because why risking a sore throat, right? Also, I want to avoid like having too dry a mouth because like mouth smacking sounds are, um, I don't know, um, not the best thing to listen to, to hear when you're trying to listen to a, to a lecture. Um, so... Cold air is, you know, the most important thing for the cold air damming events, of course. And um, what ends up happening most of the time is that you have an accumulation, as we said, of cold air uh, upwind of um, uh, on the mountainside. And this creates a, a region called cold, cold air dome, you know, more or less shallow region where cold air is kind of trapped. And... Uh, on on top of this, you can still have air that is advected and that passes over this cold air dome. Um, you could imagine that even in a situation like this, you could imagine, I guess theoretically, you could imagine that lifting warmer air over the cold air, you'd have maybe an interaction between the two, right? Because the two are like, you know, touching each other. Uh, so maybe you could promote mixing. But in fact, remember that one of the parameters that we used to assess whether cold air damming was happening or not was the fruit number. And the fruit number had to do, uh, among other things, with the static stability of the atmosphere. Now, if you advect even warmer air on top of the cold dome, the cold air dome, the static stability will increase even more. And so we'll make the cold air damming uh, potentially even worse. Not to mention the fact that if you're advecting warm, potentially moist air, if we think about Appalachian regions, maybe it's air that's coming from the ocean, and so maybe it picked up a lot of uh, moisture. Uh, this air, as it lifts, it condensates, creates clouds. The clouds are going to shield the cold air dome from shortwave radiation that could warm uh, the air. Actually, cold, the radiation will not warm the air itself, but it could warm the surface that would then um, sort of warm the air uh, via surface flexes. But if you put a, you know, a deck of stratus clouds above that, then you're not going to get that. And so potentially having the warm air flying over the cold air dome, it could make the cold air damming event uh, even more or even worse. Um, another thing that I was almost forgetting to mention, warm air, go warm air goes up, condenses, creates precipitation. Precipitation falls, and it falls in the cold air dome. 
cold air dome is cold. Potentially it's dry because it's advecting air from the north. And so precipitation will evaporate, which will cool down the air even more. All these things are potential. I'm not saying that, you know, they happen all the time, but the your intuition, our intuition, that having warm air in close contact with the colder dome would help uh, erode the colder damming um, may not be correct uh, necessarily. Some events are um, driven mostly by synoptic conditions, as we will see, and so it doesn't really make any difference whether you know, there is warm advection or not. But some events, maybe they don't have such a strong synoptic forcing. And for these events, these processes make a lot of difference at, and could make uh, the colder dome much worse, significantly worse, or they could make it go away um, in a short amount of time. We can look at an example. Uh, this is from uh, Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, forgetting if that's where Joy comes from. Joy, are you from Greensboro, North Carolina? Um, well, regardless, this is a sounding from your hometown. I don't know if you remember what you were doing on 5 December 2002 at 12 UTC, but whatever you were doing, you were probably surrounded by an atmosphere that looked like the sounding that you see on this slide. Um, so the plot on the left shows um, a uh, an analysis with a numerical model, and you can see there are all the arrows and things are named um, uh, appropriately. You can see this thin layer of cold air um, that is um, that is at the bottom uh, to the east of the mountains, and then there is this warm advection uh, sort of surmounting it and going over the mountain if you look carefully. Uh, the soundings are pretty interesting, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, we're we're gonna see the sounding again um, next time when we will talk about winter storms, um, and we'll talk about uh, yes, I think we'll see the sounding again when we'll talk about super cool liquid liquid water and um, freezing rain, but. The sounding is interesting because it shows um, it shows. Uh, first of all, let me tell you what it shows exactly. Um, the uh, yes, yeah, so the red line. Yeah, the red line is temperature, and dew point temperature is in blue. Clearly, you can see there is. A fair amount of saturation, uh, as it seems, and um, the red line, sort of diagonal red line. Um, these are likely firefighters, I think. I always found it interesting that in the UK, where I did my PhD, uh, the firefighters are called the fire brigade, the fire brigade, um, and somehow it. I don't know, I just said a lot about the cultural differences between the UK and the US that in one case it's the fire brigade, which is such a, I don't know, um, old style, you know, uh, kind of name. And here it's like the firefighters. <laughs> like, anyway. Um, the diagonal red line is um, is an isotherm, and it's the zero degree, zero Celsius degrees isotherm. So anything to the uh, left of it is uh, sub-freezing temperatures. Anything to the right is uh, above freezing temperatures. <clears throat> it's interesting that there is a layer between 925 hectopascals and 700 hectopascals, give or take, where you have above freezing temperatures. And this is likely a result of the warm advection. You have warm air that's coming above it. There's a lot of saturation, so you could imagine it's probably raining uh, because, you know, in, in, that, in that layer. And then between 925 hectopascals and 1,000 hectopascals, it's sub-freezing temperatures, and this is the cold air dome. 
Also, notice the wind barbs to the right and notice how there is such a strong veering of the winds um, as you go below 925 hectopascals. Okay, so this is what this is an example of what um, of what cold air advection looks like. Um, as an interesting mental experiment, thought experiment um, that we could do. Suppose you have a tank of dense fluid, you know, a tank of water, and suppose that, um, well, the firefighters um, uh, pass by again. Um, so you have this tank of dense water, okay? As is every any kind of water, because water is dense. Um, suppose you remove the barrier of this, uh, one of the barriers of this tank, and you let the water go. Now, um, if you ever played with water, you'd know that, you know what happens if you open the tank, right? Water would just go down, and it would just keep going. However, interestingly, if you do that on a rotating plane, then you'd have something that comes along together with the pressure gradient force of when you release um, the tank. So when you open the one of the barriers of the tank, clearly there's a lot of pressure from the water and very little pressure from lack of water on the other side. And so you're going to have a pressure gradient that develops, and this is what pushes the water out. However, if you're on a rotating plane, then you're also going to develop a Coriolis force. Coriolis isn't only on Earth, is on everything that rotates, is on a merry-go-round, is on, you know, your car every time you turn. Any rotating frame has a Coriolis force. And depending on how fast uh, your tank is rotating, if it's rotating fast enough, the Coriolis force may actually be strong enough to kind of counterbalance uh, the pressure gradient force. And when that happens, Suppose that you have, um, you know, a large enough tank. The same thing as the cold air damming would happen. You'd reach an equilibrium state, and you develop um, sort of an equilibrium flow uh, directed on sort of out of the slide in this case. Um, interestingly, if you were to do the math, then the shape of the fluid, the, the shape that the fluid would take, would be an exponential and Particularly, it would be uh, a negative exponential, e to the minus um, x minus x over, we can call it l, you know, with, with, where l is some length scale. Um, l actually turns out to be uh, essentially the Rossby radius of deformation that we had introduced in previous classes. And it also gives you some intuition as to what this radius of deformation is. Uh, at least in this case, uh, this, the Rossby radius in this case dictates how fast the shape of the water uh, is going to uh, flatten out, if you will. You know, uh, at what point, uh, it's called the e-folding distance, if you will. You know, at what point have you, uh, um, have you travel um, far enough from, uh, from the beginning? Of, uh, of the tank. Um, so this is an interesting sort of interesting observation, I guess. And it goes against our intuition because most of our intuition is based on non-rotating frames. We are on a rotating planet. Uh, that's, I think, obvious to uh, most people. Um, at least since Copernicus, I would say. Um, but our the Earth doesn't rotate so fast that we would notice it like on our daily life, apart from the weather. But um, and so we don't really have great intuition for rotating frames. Um, in this case, uh, you know what happens with the cold air damming, and in this situation with releasing the barrier, um, this is something that is exquisitely rotating frame, non-inertial frame, like. Um, and it kind of goes against our intuition, if you will. So this is a good way, I think, to conceptualize what is what is going on. You know, some simple experiment, which in principle you could do at home. Not that I'm recommending it, but, you know, if you're staying inside, 
You don't know what to do. Maybe you're tempted to go outside because you're saying, hey, there's nothing to do. I don't know. Maybe you have something that looks like a rotating tank. I don't know. Maybe this is something you, again, not saying you should do it, but, you know, I'm also not saying you shouldn't do it. Just saying, you know, just. So another way to study colder damming events is uh, by using uh, numerical models, essentially. Now, I think, depending on who you ask, there are different, uh, you know, people react differently to using numerical models. If you ask people, um, you know, sort of um, the older generation of meteorologists, um, they'll tell you that models are wrong and that models are not to be trusted, models are terrible. Um, if you ask young people, um, I'd like to include myself in the category, though I don't know if I qualify, if I still qualify. But if you ask young people, numerical models sometimes are considered as the solution to all our problems, right? Let computers do it. I guess reality kind of sits in the middle. Uh, as long as you know and you're mindful of the limitations of numerical models, numerical models can actually be pretty useful. Uh, should we trust numerical models uh, 100%? Well, of course not. Um, at least not when it comes to you know weather and extremely complex phenomena. One good thing that we could do with numerical models that we couldn't do in any other way is that we could take a weather event, we could tweak our models in such a way that they reproduce this weather event reasonably well, and then we could try and do what are called sensitivity experiments. So we could try and play with reality in order to assess what things play uh, an important role. Um, for example, one thing we could do here, we could go back to the case that we saw uh, earlier on, the case of the cold air damming in February 2003, that we had also talked about a few classes ago. And we could ask, is it really true that the mountains played an important role? Um, cold air damming mechanism that I just showed to you is plausible. And, you know, when you look at the weather maps relative to that event, it could be that the mountains are indeed what caused that event, but could also be other things. Maybe, I don't know, the pressure had decided to do something. Maybe there was, I don't know, something from the stratosphere that came down, who knows, you know, there's so many things around. And so one thing you could do is run a simulation where you try to reproduce your weather event, check with reality, with all the data available, that the essential features of the simulated weather event um, are similar to the essential features of the real weather event. And then once you're sure that your model is good and could do this, do another simulation where you remove the mountains completely. And in a model, this is simple because you could just put in some lines of code that say, you know, um, mountains equal flat. It's not It's not as simple, but it's, it's simple enough that you could do it with a few lines of code. Um, and so let's consider let's take a look at this weather event a little bit this cold damming weather event a little bit more closely um low pressure to the southwest uh you can see florida you can see the carolinas the gulf coast and the east coast going up i think i can see um, massachusetts uh, and all the way up to canada low pressure to the west oh, also sorry i forgot to mention blue lines sea level pressure you also have wind barbs, um, and that's about it. Uh, and then you have sort of coastal, coastal contours. Low pressure to the southwest, high pressure to the northeast. This looks like, you know, a perfect scenario for colder damming. So this is uh, 00 UTC, 15 February 2003. So let's go forward 12 hours. That was a loud explosion um, that you just heard. I don't know what's going on <laughs> with the firefighters and explosions. Uh, I hope I can 
go through this class um, in one piece. Um, so we move forward 12 hours. This is 12 UTC. Um, let's go forward another 12 hours. This is 00, zero uh, 16 February. And now notice that near the Carolinas, now you're starting to see uh, the uh, ridging to the east of the mountains and the troughing to the west. And also notice how the ridging seems to be more accentuated than the troughing. Okay. Forward again. Now, low pressure is, you know, moved more to the... Um, uh, to the east, the high pressure has come down a little, and so you have all these, you know, really closed, close, closely spaced. Excuse me, isobars. Uh, you know, the damming is even stronger, or the repercussion, the effects of the damming on the pressure is even stronger. Let's go forward another hour, twelve hours. This is 17 February 2003 at uh, zero UTC, and uh this is again even stronger now notice that what we had discussed the other time when we were talking about extratropical cyclones is happening where the low pressure is kind of squeezed against the mountains and we'll see when we move forward 12 more hours you'll see it popping up on the other side uh you know sort of going around um this ridging and this is exactly what we remember this i think this is one of the pictures that uh, we saw the other time you still have a little bit of the colder damming this is probably during the erosion um phase and you know it's kind of lifting a little bit um okay so very good uh you know we could try and reproduce this with the model uh and this is what we're going to see in the next slide uh, this is the model. This refers to um, zero UTC, uh, 17 February. Um, so the black lines are sea level pressure again, I would say. And the green lines are, um, I want to say, 950 millibar potential temperature. And I want to say, because I just read it, it's not like I, I, I could sense it. Um, now... Certainly, if you start to look into this, you will notice differences with reality. But the essential features are kind of there. You know, you still observe the ridging uh, around along the Appalachian Mountains. There's a low pressure to the to the west. You know, the key components are there. Now, let's do another simulation where the Appalachians are, are completely removed, and let's look at uh, what sea level pressure and uh, 950 millibar potential temperature look like. You see that the ridging and the troughing are completely or almost completely gone uh, now. You have this uh, low pressure center. Um, I want to say... I want to say that's South Carolina. It's above Georgia probably South Carolina. Uh, I'm sorry that my knowledge of geography is um, poor, but yeah, I'll go with Seth, South Carolina. You let me know if that was wrong. Um, and because we have the, out, the two outputs of the model, we could actually take the difference between the two. And this is what the difference in sea level pressure would look like. Uh, now the green contours uh, mainly referred to um, differences in sea level pressure. Now, the difference is not astronomical. It's not like we go from a thousand millibar to, you know, eight hundred millibar. So, okay, you know, it's not astronomical, but it's actually quite uh, substantial. Uh, we're talking about ten millibar differences, uh, which you know, could cause, uh, you know, which is enough to cause disruptions in, in the local, in the local circulation. So, uh, I guess the point here that I wanted to get across is numerical models, uh, can actually be pretty important in, in, in looking at, uh, at these events. Equally important is to, uh, try and look, try and construct climatologies of these events to know 
which areas are more prone to it, um, to cold air damming. If you'll become a National Weather Service officer, you'll be trained, and according to where you end up, you'll be trained in certain ways. So if you will end up going to North Carolina, um, you'll see, you know, you'll probably see a lot of this. If you decide to stay in Hawaii, probably not so much cold air damming. Um, we do have mountains here, but A, we don't really have a lot of cold air. Um, B, the mountains are kind of isolated here. There's like, you know, uh, mountainous islands scattered around, and it's not really like a strong barrier that could impede the flow um, to, uh, to move along. And uh, essentially, wherever you have uh, big mountain ranges, you could have colder damming. We're still talking about the mid-latitudes, right? But... Um, so in in the U.S., you could have colder damming on the West Coast, for example. And the situation would have to be reversed now because um, um, the sort of you could have a situation where the flow is westerly, it hits the mountains, and instead of uh, instead of um, going up, uh, above the mountain, it's going to trap there, and it's going to generate the same type of phenomenon. Maybe you'll be advecting warmer air from the south, so maybe it will not be, you know, such a strong colder damming, uh, but it's still kind of the same idea. The idea is tall mountain ranges can affect the um, balance, the geostrophic balance between the Coriolis force and the pressure gradient force, and this can generate along the barrier flow which could cause northerly or southerly wind, which in turn would have potentially big impacts on um, on the weather. So West Coast could be one example. You could have on the East Coast, you could have um, sort of cold and moist air from the uh, from the ocean that could sort of surge along the barrier and have something like this. Uh, eastern slopes of the Rockies, uh, where sort of the opposite would happen. Uh, you you could have colder damming um, on the east slopes of the Rockies, but also on other countries as well. Um, so New Zealand is a perfect example where these things um, happen. Iceland also is, um, is, um, is another place where uh, colder damming can happen and so forth. So this is not unique to the United States, okay? Okay, so next thing that I want to discuss is what do um, colder damming event look like uh, typically? And um, as I drink again, some people made <clears throat> some climatologies and divided colder damming events into mainly three categories. The first category that uh, people recognized is so-called classical colder damming. An example of this we've seen, uh, we've seen before. Um, you know, the 2003, February 2003 event. Um, this doesn't require anything other than air being pushed against the mountain and then starting to flow uh, towards the south. It doesn't require latent heat release. Uh, it doesn't require anything. Uh, and these can be quite strong and they are, uh, you know, sort of the more typical that we can find in, um, in, uh, in, these, um, in these regions. They're one of their uh, prominent features is the presence of a relatively strong anticyclone to the north. And the anticyclone, you know, high pressure system, is important because it creates the pressure gradient force directed south. If you had an anticyclone to the south, then you, you wouldn't have, uh, you, wouldn't have um, you know, the pressure gradient force would be directed in the other direction. Um, and... Uh, you can have other types that are kind of that are called hybrid, where you still have this kind of uh, here the book calls it dry synoptic forcing, meaning that diabotic heating is not really particularly important. Uh, 
But in the hybrid case, you could actually have uh, diabetic heating being really important. And diabetic heating can be important because, for example, the release of latent heating in the troposphere could increase the static stability and trap the cold air, um, the cold air in between. Um, and then there are events called in situ, where uh, diabetic heating processes are um, essential. Um, and uh, yeah, so these are kind of the, the main three categories, uh, if you will. If uh, we look at their um, occurrence, uh, so this, I believe, is based on... This is based on a paper, and um, yeah, so this is for southeastern United States, sort of the region that um, where we saw the colder damming uh, earlier on. Uh, the green bars here, x-axis is our, our x-axis are months, and uh, y-axis is frequency. Green bars are obviously the frequency of uh, all the cases. The uh, classical uh, are represented by the yellow bars, and uh, the blue bars are still classical, but with a little bit of help, uh, not from my friends, but from um, diabetic heating. And um, I suppose this is kind of what you'd expect more or less where you have more events uh, during the winter but it's interesting that you can also have more events um, in you have a second peak in August and September now we've seen an event in February and the name itself suggests cold air damming so a lot of cold air is coming down so in my mind I always you know I would think about I would think of winter winter weather snow and and stuff like that but this could happen in other times of year. Uh, and so it's not so weird to have this happen in September. Maybe the sounding for September wouldn't look like the sounding for January or for February, so you wouldn't have freezing rain, um, but you could still have the same mechanism. As long as you can have high pressure to the, strong high pressure to the northeast, and strong here means, you know, above a thousand uh, millibar, give or take, then you could have a situation like this, you're not advecting cold air per se, but I guess colder air um, you're advecting. Okay. Um, another interesting categorization that you could do is divide colder damming events into uh, based on the impact that they have on the weather uh, on the surface. And so uh, you could divide them in high impact and low impact based essentially based on you know, how they affect the weather. And then you could look at um, synoptic conditions associated with these two types of events. So is there, in other words, is there something that distinguishes high impact and cold and, and low impact events, uh, cold, colder damming events? This is important because as a forecaster, this could help you uh, predict essentially what may happen, you know, kind of the features that you expect. Um, on the graph here, the top two panels are showing uh, sea level pressure anomalies and uh, the shading, the shading, okay, the, the shading has to do with statistical, signif signif statistical significance. Um, okay, sorry. The contours are um, sea level pressure, and the shading has to do with statistical significance of the anomaly. Um, so greener colors is, um, green shading is associated with really high statistical significance. The bottom two panels um, refer to, uh, to 150 millibar heights, geopotential heights. And uh, the shadings now, are isotacks, okay, so wind speed essentially, the jet. Um, and to the left, it's the high impact colder damming, to the right, low impact colder damming. Now, the surface patterns associated with these events is kind of similar. You know, the high impact 
you know, the region, the area is a bit bigger, and, you know, it has some kind of geometric features that differ, but by and large, it's the same story. The high impact event, on the other hand, have, if, uh, sorry, the, if you look at the 200 millibar geopotential heights, on the other hand, the, the high impact has a lot stronger wind um, than the low impact, and also it has a second maximum to the south, so it's second a uh, jet streak to the southwest of the first um, uh, of the first jet streak. And this is kind of interesting because it tells you something about what may happen um, because of these, uh, you know, in these two different events. So, because you have such a strong jet streak, you might expect next to the entrance, you might expect forcing for ascent, and so you might expect clouds, you might expect precipitation. And that, in turn, affects the dynamics itself of the coal air damming. It affects how long the cold air damming is going to last, which we'll see in a minute. It's actually one of the most challenging things uh, to look at, you know, because you're, as we said at the beginning, we're shielding with the clouds. Uh, and so maybe the cold air damming could last even more. Um, another uh, uh, classification that we could do is we could uh, divide it, we could divide the two in heavy precipitating and low precipitating. Um, the top three panels are for heavily precipitating events and lower panels for um, low precipitating events. And um, it's still kind of the same as we, the, uh, the panels on the left is 250 millibar potential heights like the last slide. Uh, the two panels on the right, this is sea level pressure. The panels in between, this is 850 millibar geopotential height. So this kind of gives you some understanding of uh, lower latitude and kind of where maybe the top of the cold air, of the cold air dome may be. Again, nothing extraordinarily different in terms of the low level, low level circulation, but heavily precipitating events indeed seem to have a much stronger jet streak, which again, more forcing for ascent. And so, you know, could, could have stronger clouds. Okay, so how does uh, colder damming stop? What are the processes that erode uh, colder damming uh, events? Well, this, as it turns out, is one of the most challenging aspects of um, forecasting colder uh, damming events. Uh, and this is where models often make mistakes because some of the processes the models cannot represent really well. And this is where you should be suspicious of the models <clears throat> if you're trying to forecast that. Um, there are um, there are essentially five main mechanisms that can affect uh, the demise of the cold air damming event. The first one uh, is the uh, cold air advection. So imagine a situation, look at the pictures that we're showing here. Uh, the left is an, sort of a, um, a um, cross-section of the mountains that shows the advection of cold air. And to the right, we have some idealized sounding for potential temperature. Okay. Notice the top, the B um, figure, the B panel. This has the cold dome. Then there is a very sharp inversion, uh, you know, let's say 850 millibar <clears throat> at the beginning of the free troposphere, and then uh, air kind of warms up above it. If all of a sudden you advect cold air, then this inversion is going to be eroded essentially by the advection of cold air. What this does is it um, decreases the static stability. When you have really high static stability, the two different air masses, the cold and the warm, they kind of communicate, they mix a little bit, but the mixing is typically not uh, strong enough to erode the inversion. Unless you have really strong wind shear, um, it will take a while before the mixing actually does it. On the other hand, if you infect a lot of cold air, then this inversion is kind of eroded out, and now air is more free to move up and down, and this could actually could cause 
uh, the cold air to go away. You know, if everything is cold, then there's no cold air damming anymore because, you know, everything is cold. The other thing that could happen is kind of the other, the opposite in a way. And you could have a situation where you have a lot of heating from below. The heating warms up the air column, you know, and steers up convective motions. Convection mixes the air in the colder dome. And because you're inputting heat into the air column, um, this actually causes uh, the air to not be cold anymore. So cold air damming goes away because there's no cold air anymore. Again, Richardson number numbers increases, number increases, um, static stability um, decreases, more mixing, no more uh, cold dome. Obviously, things like... Um, um, liquid water clouds, thick liquid water clouds are going to be enemies to this because um, stratus clouds, cumulus clouds uh, block incoming shortwave radiation. Uh, another thing that could happen is that, uh, well, that you could have essentially divergence within the cold dome, right? We're assuming in this case that so far we're assuming that nothing was happening and that you know, the cold air, which is going to stay there. But you could have a situation where, for whatever reason, you know, maybe it's escaping north or south or, you know, maybe sideways. I don't know. Uh, but you could have some divergence. The divergence by continuity is going to cause subsidence in the sort of inversion layer. And this is going to, essentially, it's going to squeeze the cold dome away. So you're not going to be left with any cold dome. And finally... Uh, well, not quite so finally, but another thing, you could have a lot of wind shear. Now, wind shear, I don't know how much you remember from turbulence, but wind shear is great for creating mixing because turbulent mixing is a response to an inequality in the conditions of the fluid. And if you have shear, you're putting together two uh, boundaries. You're creating a boundary between two fluids with very different velocities. And what the fluids want to do is really mix and try to, you know, come to some kind of an agreement. And and so this is where you develop instabilities on shear lines. And these promote a lot of mixing. Uh, this can be important, for example, in uh, planetary boundary layer growth. Um, and it could be important here because it can promote the mixing between the, the colder dome and whatever lies li lies above, okay, instead of the warmer air. And this, together with some convective motions, can then be sort of propagated into the colder dome. And essentially, you would erode the colder dome from above until there's none left anymore. And finally, well, finally, you could just have a massive front pass by and disrupt uh, the conditions, the synoptic conditions, more or less completely. Uh, so, you know, nothing to worry about if you have a massive cold front that destroys everything. So these are the main mechanisms that um, that people recognized um, for the erosion of, of cold air damming. Okay, so what happens at the end of the cold, uh, cold air damming? Um, well, for the Appalachian regions, uh, people did some climatologies and they found that essentially four scenarios were the most common, if you will. Uh, the first thing that can happen after cold air damming uh, erosion is the passage of a synoptic cold front. This is associated with the last erosion mechanism. So, uh, you know, the two are str strongly related. Uh, you could have the passage of a low to the northwest of the damming. Uh, so this could disrupt the pressure gradient force. Uh, you could have gradual demise of stagnant residual air. Uh, that uh, gradual demise of the uh, dam of the colder dome as the stagnant air kind of mixes with uh, the warmer air above. Or you could also have a coastal cyclone to the east of the dam. Uh, of the damming event uh, sort of pass by uh, and, and sweeping things away. Um, and we can actually see an example of the demise of uh, the cold air, uh, the cold air damming. This is, um, I think this is a new event. 
uh, 30, 31 October 2002. Uh, we are seeing uh, panel A and B. These are two different uh, moments. These are uh, surface observations of sea and sea level pressure analysis uh, shown in dark blue contours. And two meter isentropes, these are the red dashed um, contours. Uh, the two moments are 30 October 0 UTC and 31 October 0 UTC. Then you can see uh, surface observations superimposed to uh, visible. This is GOES 8, which says a lot about the progress that we've had uh, in, well, shoot, 18 years. Uh, wow. Wow, 18 years. Okay. Uh, yeah, in 18 years. And um, finally, soundings. Uh, the, um, rad, the red dashed contour are for um, the um, for uh, 18 UTC, 30 October. And the black contours, the black lines are for 36 hours later, so a day and a half later. And uh, here the colder damming ended because of the passage of a cyclone. And uh, you can see, well, you can see, first of all, by looking at sea level pressure, you can see how uh, sort of the ridging and troughing are completely disrupted. And also you can see in, um, in the soundings how, if you just look at the temperatures, how the temperatures change, um, you go from surface temperatures of about 10 degrees uh, Celsius to about 20 degrees Celsius in about 36 hours. So there's a pretty dramatic, um, so there's a pretty dramatic shift between, um, between the two. Okay, I think this concludes uh, what I wanted to tell you about cold air damming. So, so what we're gonna do now is that at the end of the lecture, as usual, I would like you to send me your map discussions as you've done uh, so far. Write them down if you want. Uh, film yourself if you prefer to do that. Be creative. Um, and uh, yeah, pl so please send me a couple of paragraphs. Pick a place. It can be the place where the weather challenge is taking place. It can be any other place. Um, as long as it's in the mid-latitudes, Hawaii is good. Um, but uh, yeah, so send me a few paragraphs about the past situation present conditions and what you'd expect to happen in the future. Please continue to do the weather challenge. Um, I, in terms of classes, last time we saw, we talked about bare clinic instability and we said that in that case, we weren't gonna have a lab uh, because it was just a lot of math. And uh, you know, you're probably gonna see all that math in other classes anyway, so you don't need to do that. In this case, uh, we will have a lab and that's what we will do for the next class. So next class, no video, you guys do the lab. You should have all the material. You can find it, you can find it on my webpage. Um, as usual, I am available for everything, for anything. If you have any questions about colder damming or even baroclinic instability or even any of the things that we discussed before, please send me all your questions. Uh, you can write me an email. You have my Skype contact, my phone number anything uh, at all, just please call me. As usual, uh, call me for anything, even if it's not strictly related to colder damming or synoptic meteorology or university life at all. Um, we're seeing things getting worse and worse. And so I am available for anything. If you need someone to talk to, I'm here. Um, if you have any concerns, please feel free to, to reach out and uh, I'll do all I can uh, to, to help you. I will never get tired of emphasizing how much you should stay inside. Do not go out for any reason. Um, don't go to the beach. Don't go see your friends. Please self-isolate. I think what is becoming more and more clear is that um, this epidemic that we're facing is extremely serious and will continue for weeks um, and most likely until the end of this class. Please don't underestimate your risk. 
the risk that you run. Uh, don't overestimate your uh, confidence. Uh, be always very careful. Don't be scared. Don't panic. There's no need to panic. There's no need to be particularly scared. Um, but please do not underestimate um, the, um, the virus and, and what we're facing. As usual, we're in this together and you're not alone. We're all here for you. I hope until next time that will be devoted to winter storms. I hope that you'll be well. And um, yeah, as usual, feel free to reach out for anything.